Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, San Diego School Board is taking another look at campus safety and ways to prevent gun violence. Is a San Diego landmark going up for sale? There are reports tonight of some possible buyers. Also coming up, why City Council President Todd Gloria wants to override the mayor's veto of two appointees to San Diego's Port Commission. Then, do you have what it takes to become one of the few and the proud? One of San Diego's famous Marines has a way to help you find out before joining the Corps. I'm Peggy Pico with those stories just ahead. And a couple of rare birds have made themselves at home near Ramona in the East County. We'll show you how biologists are trying to keep them comfortable so they'll stick around for years to come. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs, and by San Diego Unified School Leaders will vote on a resolution tonight to advance school safety. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert joins us from the News Center with more on this story. Uh, the board voted two weeks ago, Kyla, to review the safety precautions at school sites. What else are they talking about now? Well, the resolution they'll consider tonight includes support for Senator Dianne Feinstein's reauthorization of the assault rifle ban, the creation of a psychological emergency response team within the school police department to prevent school vi violence, and providing additional mental health services and training for staff through a partnership with the San Diego Psychological Association. And what would that type of partnership look like? Well, they're still figuring that out. The effort is being led by a group of psychologists free of cost. And at a press conference today, Richard Levac said that what they'll do first is gather feedback from teachers, students, and parents. Often when you go to the shop floor, so to speak, there are people who have ideas, who know what might work. And so first of all, we're going to start trying to understand what their worries are, what they think might work. They plan to start collecting that feedback next month and for the trainings to start in March. KPBS reporter Kyla Calvert. The San Onofre nuclear plant is also on the school board's agenda tonight. Trustees are considering a resolution calling for the plant to stay offline until federal regulators conduct a rigorous license amendment process. The nuclear plant's uh, been offline nearly a year after a leak was found in a tube carrying radioactive water. The resolution says any accidental radiation release would have a profound impact on children. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has scheduled a public meeting in three weeks to discuss plans to restart San Onofre. It's being held at a church nearby in San Juan Capistrano. The information is on your screen. The church has room for about 1,100 people. And the NRC is encouraging folks to come to the meeting. They'll also stream it online. You can find the meeting information on our website at kpbs.org. The county district attorney is asking parents to get involved in their child's Internet activity. Bonnie Dumanis says in the past year they've dealt with 60 cases where the web was used to victimize children. That's double the number from a year before or the year before. KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson joins us from the News Center. So the DA is offering some free help to parents, Eric. What is it? Well, Dwayne, the help is free computer software that Dumanis is making available to anyone who asks for it. The Computer Cop software program allows parents to monitor what their children do online. It tracks cookies from websites. It monitors chat room activity, even tracks pictures and videos that are viewed by children on their home computer. The program can notify parents by email as soon as there is suspicious activity. 60 cases doesn't sound like a lot when you compare it to a county population of 3 million people. Is this considered a serious problem? Well, Dumana says it is. She says one in seven young people online are solicited for sexual purposes or they're approached online. A third of young people online were exposed to sexual material. The DA says one case last year involved a 16-year-old girl who became a victim of human trafficking after meeting a gang member online. A 12-year-old girl had sex with a 24-year-old man after they met online. 
and that sexual encounter was photographed. And there was the case of a 15-year-old who chatted with a 44-year-old predator online, and then they met to have sex. Now, where can parents get the monitoring software? They can pick it up at the district attorney's main office or one of the three regional offices. Uh, we have the information online at kpbs.org. The software is free, and 5,000 copies are being made available. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson. A new poll shows 62 percent of Americans now favor letting illegal immigrants become U.S. citizens. The Associated Press GFK poll has shown a steady climb in support for a pathway to citizenship over the past few years. As this poll was being released today, immigrant rights activists rallied in San Diego in support of a federal immigration overhaul. KPBS reporter Katie Orr has that story. As President Barack Obama begins his second term, immigrants' rights activists are looking to capitalize on his more liberal agenda. At a rally in San Diego, Mayor Bob Filner said, we have to look at the border as the center of the region and not a cul-de-sac to the community. Filner says to reform the country's immigration policy, we must take a comprehensive approach that includes looking at things like enforcement and legalization and making it easier for people to work here. Filner plans to open an office in Tijuana in February, and activists say they're working with senators to reform federal immigration policy. Katie Orr, KPBS News. San Diego Mayor Bob Filner exercised his veto powers for the first time on Friday, blocking City Council's recent appointees to the Port Commission. The council president says he's planning a meeting to override Filner's veto. Peggy Pico caught up with a former Port Commissioner earlier today for more on the veto's impact. Joining me with further details on uh, what's likely to happen next is former Port Commissioner Mike McDade and City Councilman Kevin Faulkner. Thank you both for being here. Mike, the first question is for you. You were Port Commissioner for seven years. What does the commission do? In 1962, the state of California established the San Diego Port District to take care of the tidelands around San Diego Bay. And that's what Port Commissioners do. They're in charge of uh, taking care of all the businesses there, making sure the uh, missions of the state are carried out. And it's a very important job. There are seven commissioners, uh, three of which are appointed by the city of San Diego and four by the other cities. And we're gonna get back to the, the three in San Diego with those two seats open. Um, Kevin, you got a memo from the mayor on Friday that outlined four reasons for the veto. The first, District 4, he said, is a vacant seat, so there's no representation. Second, he said there's a lack of city vision and policy for our port. He also said there should be a set of qualifications and called the selection process, this most recent one, flawed. A lot of people would say, is there not a, a set of qualifications already for the commissioner? Is there, first of all? I think we've had a process that has served our city very, very well. The gentleman sitting next to me, Mike McDade, I think is proof of that. A lot of the work that Mike did, particularly our North Embarcadero Visionary Plan. We have an open process where we encourage candidates to apply. Uh, they submit their resumes, and in fact, then they, the finalists are, are brought before the city council uh, to answer questions. Um, and it's a process that's been opened, and it's a process that I think not only has served the city well, but served it well in this round. We have we settled on two great candidates, a Republican and a Democrat, uh, both with excellent qualifications, business backgrounds, and, and I think we're going to see some fresh faces on that port commission. And so I would urge us to strongly move forward. So just to recap, the qualifications are rather are loose and open because you want a broader pool? We do, and, and we're trying to right now. So, for example, when we encourage as many San Diegans to get involved, uh, we want them to apply. We want them to come down and talk about their qualifications. Then ultimately, of course, it's up to the council and the mayor to decide, okay, is this the right individual uh, that works? Um, we did go through that process, and I think it's one that if you want to have a discussion about changing the process, you can certainly do that um, at some point. Uh, but I don't think it's fair to those individuals and everybody that went through this the last uh, couple of weeks and months. Uh, we should serve them because if we don't sit them on the Port Commission, our city, the city of San Diego, will likely go without no representation of these two commissioners for six months. Let, and I think that's a disservice. Let's talk about that timing because California is the fourth largest port in California. Out of 11, the city has three seats, as, as we talked about. One is filled. Why is the timing so important to get these guys on there now instead of, let's say, in three months from now, like the mayor might be suggesting? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. We, we have one commissioner that is serving with us, Bob Nelson. Commissioner Nelson is doing a fantastic job. 
But as you look at all of the things that are be coming down the pike for the Port Commission over the next several months, they're going to be working on environmental issues. They're going to be working on things like the North Embarcadero Visionary Plan, the Port Master Plan update, which is the blueprint and the document as to how everything on the port is going to be working for the next 20 years. And not to mention the port will be going through its budget priorities. We want San Diegans to have our full membership and representation at the table. If we wait months, we will not have that representation, and that's why I believe it would be a disservice to our citizens. All right, and Mike, uh, the mayor wants uh, the appointed commissioners to be, and he says, is accountable to the city. How realistic is that? This is a debate that's gone on many times over the years, including when I was appointed. and. It, it uh, shows a lack of understanding of the fact that the people who are appointed while they're appointed by the city are really responsible to, to taking care of the interests of all the people of California. So they've got a broader mandate. Uh, obviously, if they're selected by the city council and the mayor, uh, they're going to have a very pay, pay close attention to the city of San Diego's needs. But they've got to balance that with the needs of the overall communities, including the four South Bay cities. Okay, well, Kevin, you've said you'd join uh, Todd Gloria. He said he was going to try to override the uh, mayor with a vote. Um, how come you are on board with that? Well, because I, I believe the process that, that we have works. Uh, and I think not only did it work, but we extended the process. So we've had a lot of vetting of these great candidates. And while I can't predict what the council will ultimately do when we hear this back before us uh, in a couple of weeks, I, I, I absolutely believe that we should seat these candidates because we have two great individuals, as I said, two bipartisan uh, choices. Our city needs representation on the Port Commission, and, and we, should, we should move forward. Okay, we are out of time. Mike McDade and uh, Councilman Faulkner, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Could SeaWorld be up for sale? Our media partner, 10 News, is reporting the possibility, and the Reuters news agency says Six Flags is among the potential buyers. Another possible buyer is Apollo Global Management, owner of American Idol and Norwegian Cruise Lines. SeaWorld says it cannot comment on the reports. Last month, it filed for a public stock offering. The fresh and easy grocery chain is paying more than $800,000 for overcharging San Diego customers for meat and seafood. Prosecutors say the stores posted one price on their shelves but charged more at checkout. Fresh and easy will also have to start a new program, giving $3 off if a customer is overcharged. Some parents have pulled their children from a charter school in Encinitas because of concerns about cell phone antennas at the site. The parents say they're worried about radiation at the Innovation Center run by Julian Charter School. Investigators took radiation readings at the school and say the levels are within the safe range. Folks living near the Del Mar Fairgrounds are getting their say tonight about plans to build a train station at the site. Sandag is hosting an open house on the project. Neighbors objected in the past, but increasing traffic is creating more support. Work on the $100 million project isn't expected to start until 2020. Starting March 1st, you'll be able to take a commuter plane from San Diego to Imperial County. Seaport Air Airlines will offer nine flights a week between Lindbergh Field and Imperial County Airport. The introductory round-trip fare will be about 80 bucks for the 45-minute flight. A Marine recruit was arrested last week after he ran across the tarmac at Lindbergh Field trying to escape boot camp. Tonight, Peggy Pico talks with a former drill sergeant about his book to help recruits before they join the Corps. You've probably seen the commercials asking if you've got what it takes to become one of the few, the proud. The answer may come from a new book, The Ultimate Marine Recruit Training Guidebook, written by San Diego's own retired Marine Corps Gunnery Sergeant Nick Papadich. Nick, thanks so much for joining us. Now, you have rather an iconic reputation uh, following your Iraq tour, and you're also known as uh, the Cigar Marine. Tell us how you got that nickname. Well, that was in downtown Baghdad uh, when the Americans first came in there, Marine Corps first came in there. And it was a day that the Iraqi people and the, and the United States Marines came together as allies in building a new nation. And it was just a great day to be there. They, we tore down a statue of Saddam Hussein. And uh, it just seemed like a good time to smoke a cigar. So I was celebrating on top of my tank, smoking a cigar. 
and a photographer took a picture of it. And when I got home, I found out that was on front pages around the world. But uh, who knew? You look pretty happy there. You look pretty pleased. Oh, it was a great day. It was a day that the, those people and, and the military came together for a great thing. And uh, I was proud to be part of that mission. Tell us a little bit about your military experience. Uh, you, you entered into the Marines when you were very young. I joined when I was 18. I served as a tank, tank crewman, and then I ultimately became a tank commander. I got out after my first six years after the Gulf War. I uh, went out work construction, worked as a correctional officer for a little bit and missed the course. So I came back in and I uh, came back in in 1995, uh, served again for another 10 years as a tank commander, uh, drill instructor and a platoon sergeant. All right. And um, tell us a little bit about how you lost your eye. That was during the Battle of Fallujah and I was leading an attack in a place called the Jolan District. And uh, I was and commanding a tank, I had another tank behind me. And uh, it was just, if you'd, if you'd asked me before it happened, make a mental picture of how you, if you're going to get wounded, make a mental picture of how it's going to happen. I probably would have pictured something very similar. Lots of good guys, lots of bad guys, everybody's shooting, and uh, one of them managed to hit me. But it was uh, amazing work. The Marines uh, by my side, they saved my life that day. The corpsmen in the field covered me up with their own body armor while we were under fire, while they were working on me, and um, just blessed it. I, Although I lost an eye, I've seen the best the best our nation has in keeping me alive. And that's something that you talk about in your book here. This is your second book, and it has a lot of interesting history. For instance, uh, uh, the nickname of Leathernecks, how that came about, and the first female Marine back in 1918, which was surprising to me. Uh, it's so early on. But in reality, this is rather a step-by-step -step guide, at least it seems that way, to, to preparing yourself for going into Mar the Marine Corps. Do you think this is uh, extra necessary now, or do you think you, you wish everybody would have had it? I wish everybody would have had it, <laughs> honestly. And, uh, but serving as a drill instructor, the one thing I found out, and even going back to my own experience as a recruit, is the things you think you need to know showing up are not at all what you need to know. And that's what I go through, is the things you really need to know showing up. Because really, how to prepare yourself to train. Because you don't need to know how to right face, left face. We're going to teach you all that stuff. We're going to teach you how to tie your boots. We're going to teach you everything. It's just a matter of showing up ready to train. For, for, for instance, give us an example of that. Well, when I, first get, when I first got to recruit training as a recruit, one of the things I heard very early on is saying, everything that happens to you here will happen for a reason. <laughs> I don't care if you know what that reason is, but just know it will be for a reason. And I was the sort of individual I could take that on faith. Now, and that's what I explained to them. And I'm not gonna tell them all the whys, but I'm gonna tell them some of the whys and that everything will happen to you for a reason and it's to make you better. It's to build courage, honor, commitment. It's to build character. It's to build these leading blo building blocks of, of, of leadership. You, you talk quite a bit about this. This is something that uh, I, I think can be extrapolated to the civilian world. What do you think civilians can learn from Marines? Oh, everything, everything, because we are the best thinkers in the world, because we know how to think under duress. We know but how to people, think. people don't think that. They think you simply follow orders, right? Oh, no, it, you're absolutely right with that. That's the perception. People think that everything in the military is black and white, and it, it is the furthest thing from that, because in combat, there are a million different possibilities for every situation. What we do is we give you a mission, and then we give you limits to that mission, which are rules of engagement, SOP, these sorts of things. And within there, there's a million different ways you could attack the problem. So we build thinkers. And if you think like everybody else, you bring nothing new to the team. You're not contributing. You're not a, you're not a, a help. You're a hindrance. So we teach you how to bring your own personal talents into this thing, your own individual talents in pursuit of the team goal. And I guess that's a misconception. No, yes. you've run for Congress twice as a Republican, most recently against uh, Susan Davis in the 53rd District. Why do you want to go into politics? Because that's, that's what I talk about here, the win-win scenario, building character. And Marines, are we're problem solvers. We're not the sort of people to sit around and complain. We go in and, and make a difference. And so to me, I didn't like the direction the country was going as far as leadership-wise, political leadership. So rather than sit around and complain, I ran. And uh, let me say again that Susan Davis, what, a, what an honorable opponent, and uh, beat me fair and square, ran an honorable race, so she, uh, she has nothing but support from me. All right, well, we are out of time. Nick Popovich, author of The Ultimate, uh, Ultimate Marine Recruit Training Guidebook. Thanks so much for talking with us. Thanks for having me in. Some Republicans in Sacramento want to freeze tuition at state universities and community colleges. They've introduced bills freezing tuition from two to seven years. GOP lawmakers say more Proposition 30 money should go to help college students. Governor Brown's new budget includes $125 million for the California State University system, but the CSU says it's not enough. They say they need nearly $250 million more. For raises, maintenance, and equipment, the governor says $250 million more 
is more like a dream than reality. And San Diego native and golfing champ Phil Mickelson says he should have kept his opinions on taxes to himself last weekend. He said changes in federal and state taxes would tap into more than 60 percent of his income. He said it was a factor in his decision not to join the Padres' new ownership group and might force him to leave California. Mickelson lives in Rancho Santa Fe. Today, he says taxes are a personal matter and not for public discussion. I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next news hour, Margaret Warner reports from Tel Aviv on Israel's elections, plus the 40th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. Hope you got out to enjoy the uh, sunshine for a while today. The Weather Service says we hit a new record high temperature for this date, 79 degrees at Lindbergh Field. But we've got increasing clouds and a slight chance of rain on the way. Temperatures mostly in the 70s along the coast and inland valleys with showers possibly on Friday. It'll be a bit colder in the mountains, dipping into the 50s by the end of the week. The rain is not expected to make it out towards the desert. Ramona wildlife watchers have been enjoying a rare spectacle this winter. Two adult bald eagles have set up nest in a sweeping East County Valley just outside of town. KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson says it's a first for this area and only the second nesting pair in the county in 80 years. Wind whips across this valley floor on a recent chilly winter afternoon. Ecologist Zachary Principi points out that this 4,500-acre preserve snuggles right up against civilization. Here in the Ramona grasslands, we're only about uh, a mile and a half or so uh, west of the community of Ramona. That's about 35 miles northeast of downtown San Diego. The land is mostly flat, grass dominating the landscape, with a boulder picking through here and there. And the encroaching homes are scattered around the edge of the mountain meadow. Once targeted by developers, this little sliver of nature houses an ecosystem that has long been under siege in Southern California. The Ramona Grasslands is an ecological preserve, but there are working farms here, and it's close to the Ramona Airport, in fact, close to Ramona itself. Even so, it's a place where wildlife has found a home. To have them nesting here was completely unexpected. Nobody anticipated having nesting bald eagles as you know, part of the conservation success here in the Ramona grasslands. The perch that holds the eagle's nest gives the raptors a clear view of the surrounding valley. And just over the horizon to the south are two ponds. The water attracts duck, geese, and coots, birds that provide a steady food supply and food will be important for a baby eagle, just as important as the massive treetop nest. It takes many months for them to construct the nest. It's about five to six feet in diameter and can be two to three feet deep. Um, and yeah, they just grab big sticks from the surrounding area, usually three, four feet long, uh, pretty good size diameter. I mean, these are big birds, so they can collect pretty large uh, pieces of wood and then they just weave them together. The bald eagle is a, a magnificent uh, raptor. It's, it's one of the larger raptors in the world and we've chosen it to be our national symbol. Michael Mace is the curator of birds at the San Diego Safari Park. There are a couple of bald eagles living here, birds that have been injured and are not candidates for a return to the wild. Mace says the Ramona nest is another sign that the species, once on the endangered list, is recovering from the damaging effects of the pesticide DDT. That chemical made eagle shells brittle. As the birds were doing the incubation, they were actually breaking their own eggs. So once the toxin was removed from the environment, the birds recovered. The U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife says the eagle population dropped to about 500 breeding pairs in the lower 48 states in 1963. Now there are close to 10,000. California has about 200 breeding pairs, but this is only the second nest in San Diego County. The other is near Lake Henshaw. May says it's good to see the species expanding its breeding range. They have many options on where they might nest. This pair has just happened to set up in a, in a meadow where there's a stand of a few trees and are carrying it out. So the birds themselves are comfortable with picking that site. What we have to be careful of as, as observers is to make sure we don't encroach on a nest site like this and disturb them. Biologists at Ramona's Wildlife Research Institute will do their part to make sure the nest succeeds. It is practically within view of the institute where Chris Metter is the assistant director. Through the years, we've built up a preserve here of about 4,500 acres 
working with the Nature Conservancy and the County of San Diego. And so we've secured that land, protected it, and now we believe, you know, the bald eagles, for one, have a very stable increasing population, and two, have a safe place here in the Ramona grasslands to nest. The Institute focuses public attention on the many raptors that live in the valley. Hosting a breeding pair of bald eagles is a jewel they never expected to place in their crown. They have this nest, and if they feel comfortable in the territory, um, they could produce young. And if they don't, we would hope if it's protected properly, they'll come back next year and try again. Biologists say the pair is clearly mature enough to have chicks. They can tell because the birds' heads are white. What they don't know is how old they are. A young pair could make this a breeding home for years to come. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. Eagles usually lay one or two eggs, sometimes three. Once an egg is in the nest, it takes about 35 days to hatch. You can find tonight's stories on our website and download the KPBS app, all at kpbs.org. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.